Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. We are glad that you are joining us this morning. And what better way to get the morning started by beginning with some worship. So let's go ahead and get started. depends on this day 
The day when Jesus rose from the grave, the day when he defeated death once and for all to bring us the promise of hope and faith and joy and love in him. So we are so privileged to be able to continue to worship. And I pray that you are blessed in your home, wherever you are. I'm going to invite you to read with us. If you can see this screen at home, uh, our call to worship. And I'll ask the praise team to find their way. And read with me. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. What a message on Resurrection Day. He, they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. And he said, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. And for the last 2,000 years, that has been both the job and the responsibility and the privilege of the church. To go and tell every new generation to become brothers and sisters with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray as we continue to worship. Our Heavenly Father, everything depends upon this day. You said you would rise from the grave, and you did. And therefore, everything else you promised, we can trust in. And so we place our faith and our hope in this day, and in the day that is to come. The day when you will come to receive us all, or each one of us, one by one, into your everlasting kingdom. We worship and praise you today, Father God, even though things look different and life is a lot different than it was just a few weeks ago. One thing remains true, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We worship you and praise you today, and we trust that your Holy Spirit can reach all of our brothers and sisters wherever they are. Receive the praise and the glory from your people, however they are gathered today. The, this we ask for the glory and the praise and the love of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
I do have a couple that are not on here. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, the Hanson family uh, is in mourning. Steve has lost his youngest brother, and yet it is a praise. So, so how do we decide whether it's a prayer or a praise? Well, it's both. We're praying for the family at a difficult time, but at the same time, he knew Christ as Lord and Savior, and so he's celebrating and worshiping in heaven right now before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so that's a good thing. He was suffering, and God brought him home. We also know it's a celebration today. Ramona Dixon has passed on to be with the Lord 90 plus some good years together. She loved and praised the Lord. And at the end, when, 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 the, when the body and, and the natural decay had taken her mind and everything from her, all she had was one word left that she could say, and it was Jesus. And she was ready to be welcomed home. And so we praise the Lord for that today, as well as praying for the Dixon family. Uh, for Jason Headley and his family, they have uh, some COVID-19 symptoms. And they're being treated, uh, although they have not had a chance to be tested. So uh, they're going to be in, at home for 14 days at least. So we need to keep them in our prayers. There are a lot of things that we could praise the Lord for today. This is what we have before you. If you have prayers at home and praises, I hope that you take this time to pray as well. Would you join me again in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, as we approach you once again, we come to the throne of grace and mercy, knowing that it is a risen Lord and Savior who sits at your right hand, who mediates between us and the Heavenly Father. It gives us the right as children, as sons and daughters, to come before the throne and not only present our prayers, but our praises as well. Thank you, God, for lives that have been lived knowing you. Knowing you in such a way that the promise and the hope and the life of Jesus Christ is right there. Thank you for Ramon. Receive her into your kingdom. Thank you for Stevie's little brother. Receive him into your care. Care for these families, Lord as they deal with loss. Cover over our brothers and sisters at the Headley household. Lord, as they deal with potential uh, symptoms and signs of, of what is besetting our entire country and our entire world right now. But Lord, no matter what it is that you bring into our lives, I pray more than ever and more than anything else that we face these things in the strength and the power and the love of Jesus Christ in your Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. And then all of our prayers would go up before our Heavenly Father as a sweet Savior. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to pause and to pray and to know that we have a Heavenly Father who listens. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Samantha is or the Easter Bunny, I'm not sure, is right here to share with the children today. Samantha? Hello, everybody. I am so excited for today. You know, we met last Sunday, and we talked about how we were, they were praising Jesus coming in, and then we talked about you know, it was going to be Good Friday, and that was a sad thing, definitely. But guess what? We're back on top of the mountain, the best thing ever. Jesus is alive. He's risen. He said it. And guess what? When Jesus said something's going to happen, it's going to happen. So, I want to say Happy Easter to everybody. I got my bunny ears today because maybe the Easter bunny got to come to your house. Maybe he had to stay away until a little bit later, but... No matter what is happening, we will praise the Lord and we will be excited and just loving life today because our Savior lives. So I want to tell you a little story. This is a true story. So sometimes we may lose something in our life. Maybe we'll lose a family member and we'll be sad about that. I'll tell you something that happened to me when I was younger. When I lived in the country, mom and dad still live in the country, oh my goodness, we would have cats and dogs and everything dropped off to our house because they knew that we would take it in. I've had a horse and a cow and a goat, uh, owl, rabbit. 
habits, all these different things that we've had before. Well, one time, our little Australian shepherd, her name was Shadow, she was all black because we were really creative back then naming our animals. Anyway, she had babies, and they were the cutest little fluff balls ever. And one day, they were not there in our yard. I'm like, okay, well maybe they went in the woods. And a few hours later, I don't know where they were. And a day later, I don't know where they are. And I'm just broken hearted because our babies are gone. And we searched and we searched for them. Another day went by, no idea. So I just gave them up for lost. I'm like, okay. For some reason, our puppies are all gone, and I don't know where they are. And I cried, and I prayed, and I prayed. I just didn't know where they were. Well, another day went by, and then we heard some yipping as we're out in the woods again. We're like, what is that? And we come up to the Amish house, and guess what? All of our puppies were stowed away in a corn crib. And there's all of our babies. And I'm going to tell you the joy that filled my heart when I saw my puppies. Because I thought, oh, they're all gone. But they weren't. And I was so excited to get them back. So I think back. I'm like, can you imagine the Savior of the world dying when everybody thought he was going to come and conquer everything, and he was going to be the answer to everything, which he is, but in a different way than they thought. And then all of a sudden, he was gone, and they didn't know where he was, and they were sad. And then, like we read earlier, the women came to the tomb, and it was empty, and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? And then they said, he's not here. I mean, Jesus told everybody, hey, this is what's going to happen, but they didn't understand. And then their joy. Can you imagine? You know, I had all that joy when I found my puppies. I just can't even imagine seeing my Lord and my Savior alive. That is what I want everybody to just know that He died for you. Every single one of you. And He loves you so much. And when you think about the best joy that you've ever had in your life, Times that by a million. And that's what it's like with Jesus living with you. So take that, spread that joy everywhere. And I can't wait to see you again. And I love you very much. And I'll be praying for you. And you pray for all your family members too, okay? And I'll see you next week. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you for joining us online. If you're there, you want to turn to the book of John chapter 20. You can turn to John chapter 20 and uh, about verse 24. Kind of hold it there for just a little bit. I want to say happy Easter again, and thank you for joining us once again. We're glad that you're here. I'm actually glad. I want to say for the, for the uh, well, we'll admit to 10, no more. Folks that are in the building right now that are helping with the praise team and, and with the audio visual, I'm thankful to have you here. It's not completely empty. Uh, that does, believe it or not, make a huge difference. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online. Today's Resurrection Sunday, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the grave. The central point in Christian history, central point in all of history, really. There were many people who died on a Roman cross. Many people deserved to die on a Roman cross. But only one man ever died for somebody else. And then rose from the dead again. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. And then he rose from the dead. And in so doing, Jesus proved that even death didn't have any power over him. When I think about Easter and all that Jesus accomplished, I can't think of how desperately we need that right now. I mean, we need it in every single other day of our life, but right now I think we are more aware of it. In these uncertain times, to have something like Christ to anchor our lives to. 
I want to share with you a post that uh, Bishop Betters put online for those of us pastors. And, and uh, he said this, he said, pastors, did you ever think that you would be giving up this much for Lent? I sure didn't. Yet the Lord has used this crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. I know you're probably sick of hearing that as well as I am. The Lord has used this crisis to graciously remind me that the essence of Lent is self-denial and self-sacrifice, all for a deeper, genuine faith and a greater glimpse of His glory. When we look back at Lent 2020, we will remember it as a time when everything was stripped away and the way was cleared for us to see Jesus if we dared to. And I, and I can tell you folks honestly, not because I'm a pastor, I think I'm more spiritual than anyone else, but that has been our family's experience. Our family's experience has been to walk with the Lord closer. We started doing devotions more and more as a family and not only doing them, but having the kids lead them and every person in our household having a different perspective on the, on the faith and a different perspective on the scripture and teaching us. It's been a real joy. This Lenten season, we've taken a journey with Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount to the streets of Jerusalem. And, and when this journey began, none of us thought it would end here. Right? When we started this thing called Journey, we had no idea that the world was going to go sideways. But here we are. Along the way, it's been my prayer that together we have discovered those solid anchor points for our faith. Anchor points that would be valid even in the best of times, but especially in days like these. And I pray that you have learned what's essential in life. When everything else has been stripped away, I pray that you have found what's essential and I want to give you permission this morning to miss those things that are extra, that are missing right now. When, when I talk about something, you know, boiling life down to what's essential, we're not saying that the extra things that were around us weren't good. We're not saying that it's not okay to miss them. We're simply saying that they weren't essential in the first place. And so a lot of perspective has been gained. But I realize that even though we have found solid places to anchor ourselves, there are times when we still doubt. There are things that we still doubt. I myself have doubts, not about the big things. And I will tell you that God is in control. And I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I know he rose from the grave. And I know that he is waiting for me when this life ends. Not the big things, but how am I going to get there? What's the journey going to be like? Ever read through the New Testament and find what happened to all of Jesus' followers, the disciples? They had some rough times. Suffering and difficulty was part of their time. I wonder sometimes, how am I going to get there? Not that I'm going to get there, but how is the journey going to play out? I doubt sometimes that I'll have the strength to stand up. If I'm called to suffer, if I'm called to difficulty, I don't know. See, nobody is immune from doubt. I wonder, do you feel like that sometimes? Do you have doubts? The Gospel of Mark, there is a story of a man who had a son who was demon-possessed. It's in Mark 20, 9, 24. You, you could read the whole story for yourself, but essentially this man had a son that had a demon, and, and he had tried everything to get him healed. He'd been to the church, he'd been to the disciples, He'd done everything he could, and the, and the boy wasn't healed. And finally, he saw Jesus. And he cried out to Jesus. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. It doesn't seem like it fits, does it? Well, what he was saying was, Lord, I know you can heal him. I know you are the Lord, the Son of God. I know what you can do. I'm just unsure about what you will do. I'm unsure of how you're going to work in this situation. Maybe it's my lot to walk through life like this. Maybe I'm going to be healed in an instant. I don't know. Lord, I believe you. Help me with the things that I don't believe, the things I can't see, the things I'm unsure of. And that's where doubt can creep in. Doubt can creep into things we don't understand how God is working. And those kind of things sometimes can shake us up and shake us towards God's ultimate purpose if we'll look to Him. My final destiny in that none of those things are in question. But how's this all going to work out? 
How are we going to emerge from this when it's done? I don't know. So doubt becomes a continuous part of our life at times. The question then is, what do we do about it? How do we answer doubt? How do you and I continue to represent the certainty of Jesus Christ when we aren't sure of our present reality? I think we're going to find out that how we approach doubt is not just in the content of our answer, but in the way that we answer and the way that we respond to the person who's asking, even if that person is us. This morning, we're going to take a brief look with Thomas after the resurrection. You might know him as Doubting Thomas. Literature and, and your Sunday school teachers probably taught you about Doubting Thomas. But is that fair? Thomas was martyred for his faith. How about Thomas the Brave? Thomas the Courageous? But Thomas had doubts. He had doubts, and folks, if we're honest with ourselves, doubts can lead to faith if we are honestly searching for what's true. So folks, if, you're, if you have doubts about this world today, and I think we all do in this situation, welcome to the conversation. Welcome. Thomas had doubts. Now, one of the greatest skeptics in the New Testament was doubting Thomas, and why is that so important right now? Because the world is asking questions. And we have the answer in Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is sufficient for all things in life, this one and the one to come. We don't have all the details. But we believe he is sufficient for all things. And what I hope we find together is that even when we don't have all the answers for, for a particular person, or a situation in life, that our attitude and our heart towards people is going to make the difference in whether or not that situation leads to an opportunity for them to see Jesus. So if you have your Bibles open to John chapter 20, let's take a look at just a few verses. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, Lord and my God. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thomas was a man who wanted to have proof. He wanted to know for sure. Right? The other disciples had already seen him. I think it was a little easier for him. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. He was not a man who lacked courage. Earlier, when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, it was Thomas who said, Hey, Jesus, remember, there are people there who want to kill you. And yet he said, let's go to Jerusalem with him and let's die together. He was not a man who lacked courage. He was not a man who was not trying to find Jesus. He was a man who just needed something extra. He wasn't afraid. He didn't want to not believe. He wanted to believe. That's Thomas. And when Jesus appears again and he allows Thomas to touch his wounds, he doesn't condemn him. Look again at verse 27. He said to Thomas, reach here with your finger. See my hands. Reach here, your hand, and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. And so if Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas for wanting to be sure, why do we? Why don't we meet people where they are in their walk of faith? And how should we meet them? With love. We meet them with love. Remember the goal of our instruction in 1 Timothy says this. The goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 
That verse will preach all by itself on another day, right? Love from a pure heart, first checking my own self, a good conscience, how have I acted towards others, and a sincere faith. That'll preach all by itself. But remember, the goal of knowing Christ is not to win arguments and badger people. It is to know how to love. I try to remind my kids of this. I try to remind our folks of this all the time. When you encounter people in the world, because we all agree that the world needs the gospel right now more than ever. When you encounter people who are, are antagonistic towards it, don't want to know anything about it. The goal is to love the person. You may not win the arguments, but I have not seen very many people enter the kingdom, I can't say none, who have been won to the kingdom of God by winning a good argument. They've been won by love. Folks, if we're honest, there are some legitimate questions in our faith. Read the Old Testament. There's a lot of bloodshed in the Old Testament. There's a lot of stuff that we can't really explain. Some of the heroes of our faith were scumbags at times. Abraham to David, they had their warts too. Some of the, the people in the Old Testament, it's hard to explain. There are questions about our faith. We get to the New Testament, we see God's sovereign choice in salvation. And we wonder, how does that work with my free will? And we can't answer all of that. But one thing that has to come through any discussion and all of it is love for the person. I read a story this week about Samaritan's Purse, and I have a little experience with them. I had a chance to go after Hurricane Katrina. I had a chance to go to Biloxi, Mississippi with Samaritan's Purse. It's the organization that Franklin Graham runs. Uh, his father, Billy, would be proud, I think, of what they do. Samaritan's Purse went to New York City where some of the worst of this crisis is outbreaking, and they set up a field hospital to treat people. But not everyone was very happy about their being there. There were a lot of people that, that an evangelical organization disagrees with, and those people said he should not be here, they shouldn't be here helping people because they hate us and everything. Well, Franklin had a chance to go on television, on the news, and he said, look, I don't hate anybody. Jesus doesn't hate anybody. People we disagree with, of course. But we're here to help everybody. Right? So social media breaks out on this. And says, who is it that's really hating? Franklin Graham is going to help a lot of people that he hate, the people that hate him. So who are really... See, that's the opportunity for the real Jesus to come forward in love. Right? It's a, it's a confrontation like that. And he didn't win an argument with anybody. He won by loving the people. Folks, there's an opportunity for revival in our world today. It's not going to come from winning arguments. It's going to come from love. In essence, if you have prayed or spent time with us praying over the last year or two for revival, we may have prayed for this. We may not have chosen how it would come. But folks, eyes and ears are open to Jesus and open to the gospel right now like never before. Let's not blow. Let's approach people with love. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us how to do that. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And yet with gentleness and reverence. How do I face doubt? How do we face folks and help them in these times of uncertainty? We face it with love. What else? We also have to face it in truth. We face folks and we face uncertainty with the truth. We don't have to have every answer, but we need to know the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God come to minister in this world, live the perfect life, died a substitutionary death on the cross, and rose from the grave, that all who would put faith in him would have that promise here and forever. That's what we need to know. Paul says it this way in Romans. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek, just the rest of us. And in here, there is no place for condescension towards people who don't believe. There is no air of superiority for folks who haven't figured it out yet. We need to interact with people who don't understand without returning evil for evil. Because the scripture also says this in Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. People are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. That's why we need to approach people with love and with the truth. How else? We approach with humility. Humility, it's okay. You know, sometimes the best answer that you can give anyone is, I know I have. Sometimes it's the most honest. It's okay you to ever catch yourself trying kind to of make something up because right. you want to seem like you're smart. You've got I think people sometimes respect that more than anything else. But just because we don't have all the answers, it doesn't mean we don't have enough answers to make a choice. Church, we can use these opportunities of not knowing to interact with folks and find them an answer. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 tells us this, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Sometimes people don't really need the answer anyway. They just need to know someone cares. Empathy. Real life has real hardships that require us to have compassion and honesty. And sometimes that's all people need to know. And finally, folks, pray for wisdom. Jesus said he would meet us in the moment. He said he'd be there. He never. He said you would never interact in that way without him there. Pray for wisdom. Ask God to open the eyes of your heart to see the real need in their life and to see the real need in yours. We approach this world in this unprecedented time with love, with truth, with humility. Why? Because Jesus did. We take you back to verses 26 through 28. Peace to you, Jesus said. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. He didn't yell at him. He said, peace. Come here. I'll meet you where you're at. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. If there was anyone who had the, the ability, who had the right to respond in anger, it was Jesus, and he didn't. He could have been frustrated or disappointed, and he wasn't. He met him where he was, and he met him with love, and he met him with truth, and he met him with humility. Now look at that confession, my Lord and my God. Sometimes those who enter the faith through the crucible of honest searching, sincere doubt end up being those who worship him and grab onto him the strongest and follow him forever. Loved ones, I say this again, right now, what the world needs is Jesus. The pure gospel of the resurrected Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else will do. My prayer for you this Easter is that God will give you the joy of his presence and the power of his witness as you share in him today and share him out with the world around you. Until we meet him again, may God bless you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we stand here in the presence of the resurrected Jesus and this unprecedented opportunity, to bring him into a world that is asking questions. Foundations have been shaken. And people are looking up. Lord, empower your church. Even at a time when we just can't have our, our mass meetings on Saturdays and Sundays and small group meetings and things. At a time when we can't be together physically. Keep us together by your spirit and help us take your message, your hope, your joy, your resurrection out into this world. Help us to do it with love, with truth, and with humility, pointing all the glory and all the honor 
and all the praise towards Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Praise team, would you come and close us in song?
We love you. We miss you. We can't wait until we can meet again. Uh, we celebrate Easter and we pray that your Easter at home, wherever you are, continues to be a joy and a blessing. But this I promise you, when this is past and when we can get together, we're going to celebrate Easter all over again. we got folks to baptize who are waiting to make their profession of the Lord. And we're going to have a big old celebration. So folks, hang in there. We will get through this together until we see you again. We love you and we miss you. God bless you.